And I went towards it, and saw seven magnificent mountains, and all were different from one another in precious and beautiful stones. And all were precious, and their appearance glorious, and their form was beautiful. Three towards the east, one fixed firmly on another, and three towards the south, one on another, in deep and rugged valleys, no one of which was near another. And there was a seventh mountain in the middle of these, and in their height they were all like the seat of a throne, and fragrant trees surrounded it. And there was among them a tree such which I had never smelt, and none of them or any others were like it. It smells more fragrant than any fragrance, and its leaves and its flowers and its wood neither wither. Its fruit is good, and its fruit is like bunches of dates on a palm. And then I said, Behold this beautiful tree, beautiful to look at, and pleasant are its leaves, and its fruit very delightful in appearance. And then Michael, one of the holy and honored angels who was with me and was in charge of them, answered me and said to me, Enoch, why do you ask me about the fragrance of this tree, and why do you inquire to learn? Then I, Enoch, answered him, saying, I wish to learn about everything, but especially about this tree. And Michael answered, saying, This high mountain which you saw, whose summit is like the throne of the Lord, is the throne where the Holy and Great One the Lord of glory, the eternal King, will sit when he comes down to visit the earth for good. Hello, brothers and sisters. It's October 13th, 2020. And that is from the book of Enoch. You may remember it when I read the book of Enoch in chapter 9. And why do I start there? Well, we're doing a verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Isaiah, and it directly relates to the chapter that we're going to cover today. We're going to start in chapter 2, and let me, let me just dive in here. Chapter 2, The Mountain of the Lord. The message that Amos' son Isaiah received concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It will come about in the last days that the mountain that is the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of mountains and will be raised above the hills. All the nations will stream to it. Many groups of people will come, commenting, Come, let us go up to the temple of the God of Jacob, that they may teach us his ways. Then let's walk in his path. He will judge between the nations, and he will render verdicts for the benefit of many. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations will not raise swords against nations, and they will not learn warfare any more. You, house of Jacob, come, let's live in the Lord's light. For you have rejected your people, the house of Jacob, because they are filled with practices, learned from the east, and they are fortune tellers like the Philistines. They cut deals with foreigners. Their land is filled with silver and gold, and there is no end to their treasures. Their land is filled with horses, and there is no end to their chariots. Their land is filled with idols. They bow down to the work of their hands, to what their own fingers have made. So mankind is humbled. Each human being is brought low, and you won't forgive. Go into the rocks. Hide in the dust to escape the terror of the Lord and to escape the glory of his majesty. The haughty looks of mankind will be brought low. The lofty pride of human beings will be humbled, and the Lord alone will be exalted at that time. For the Lord of heavenly armies has reserved a time to oppose all who are proud and haughty. The self-exalting, they will be humbled. He will take his stand against all the cedars of Lebanon, against the proud and self-exalting, against all the oaks of Bashan, against all the high mountains and against all the lofty hills, against every high tower, against every fortified wall, against all the ships from Tarshish, and against all their impressive watercraft. Humanity's haughtiness will be humbled, male arrogance will be brought low, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. 
their idols will utterly vanish. They will enter caverns in the rocks and holes in the ground to escape the presence of the terror of the Lord, to escape the splendor of His majesty when He arises to terrify the earth. At that time mankind will throw their silver and gold idols that the fingers made as objects of worship to the moles and to the bats. They will enter caverns in the rocks and clefts in the cliffs to escape the terror of the Lord and to escape the splendor of His Majesty when He arises to terrorize the earth. Stop trusting in human beings whose life breath is in their nostrils for what are they really worth? This is chapter 2. And let's take a look at some things here. Going back to the beginning, many groups of people will come commenting, Come, let us go up to the temple of the God of Jacob that we that they may teach us his ways. Let's walk in his paths. Oh, I'll verse back, I'm sorry. It will come about in the last days that the mountain that is the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of mountains and will be raised above the hills. All the nations will stream to it. And you'll remember, I opened today with the book of Enoch. And that was from chapter 9. Trying to get back to there. And that was the reason I, I wanted to start there in chapter 9. because it, in a way it, it, val it validates the book of Enoch because when Michael the archangel um, tells Enoch he answered by saying this high mountain which you saw whose summit is like the throne of God is the throne where the holy and great one the Lord of glory the eternal king will sit when he comes down to visit the earth for good and then we take a look at Isaiah here. It will come about in the last days that the mountain, that is the Lord's temple, will be established as the highest of mountains and will be raised above the hills. All nations will stream to it. So you see that the correlation between these two, and, and these are written hundreds, if not thousands of years in between. You know, the, the book of Enoch, the book of Isaiah, and they're both talking about this mountain, this, this one mountain. It'll be raised above all the others. It'll come about in the last days. It will be the Lord's temple. It will be his throne, and all nations will stream to it. Coming to the temple of God to learn from him. And I find that interesting. I, I find that validating. It, it, it makes me... It's just, it's, it's an important validation. The Holy Spirit just rises up within me and says, See, see, see. It just validates that, that scripture that, that has been cast aside by the Catholic Church as rubbish. And it, it validates it in my eyes. This is what I see and, and what the Holy Spirit says to me, which is why I, I read the book of Enoch to you guys. Um, the other thing I want to cover um, before we get into the commentary on the verse by verse here is the Lord of Heavenly Armies. And I brought this up several times now because it's one of my absolute favorite titles of the Lord. I mentioned that last uh, last video. Um, it's not found in the King James because the King James uses the title the Lord of Heavenly Hosts. And I just, I don't, that's a great title, don't get me wrong. I just like this title better. And in, in the ISV it's found 228 times and 230 or 228 verses, 235 matches, and the book of Isaiah 49 times. On the NIV, I think it's like 65 times, um, which is just awesome. And and I want to go back, since I'm, I'm probably not going to do the video on this. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. But if we go back um, to Joshua, who um, led the group into Israel, led the... Led the the Hebrews out of Egypt into Israel after the death of Moses. Um, well, let me just read uh, Joshua 5.13, the commander of the Lord's army. 
Now it happened that while Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up, and much to his amazement he saw a man standing in front of him, holding a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua approached him. Excuse me. Joshua approached him and asked him, Are you one of us, or are you with our enemies? Neither, he answered. I have come as commander of the Lord's army. Joshua immediately fell on his face to the earth and worshipped, saying to him, Lord, what do you have for your servant by way of command? The commander of the Lord's army replied to Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet, because the place where you're standing is holy. So Joshua did so. Now, I've, I've read over a lot of commentaries and, and a lot of misguided brothers and sisters who think that somehow this particular land was a holy place or, or somehow is, has been made holy. But if, if you take a look at this, this passage here, it was one other time where a uh, servant was asked to remove their sandals because the ground they were on was holy. And if you remember back, that was Moses. And where was he? Was he standing where Joshua is now? No. We know that for certain because Moses was not allowed to enter the promised land. They're in Jericho in the promised land. So we know that it, the two places are separate. One was on a mountain where Moses got the Ten Commandments. The second time is when Joshua is just outside getting ready to take Jericho. These two places are hundreds, if not, well, probably hundreds of miles apart. So it has nothing to do with the ground. It's the person that's standing before the servant. And here, it's Joshua before it was Moses. Because the Lord Almighty, the the Lord God Almighty, Christ Jesus, the Lord of heavenly armies, is what makes that ground holy. That's why he commands him to take off his sandals. And why would he do that? Why would he have him take off his sandals? Think about that for just a moment. The sandals come between Joshua's feet and the ground which the Lord is standing upon. The sandals are standing between Joshua and the Lord. And the Lord wants everything that comes between you and the Lord God Almighty to be removed so that nothing comes between you and God. Nothing comes between you and Christ. This is a symbolization. It's, it's a symbol. Just like something else. Think about it for just a moment. What's the one thing that comes between you and God? sin and what's God want you to do he wants you to repent and by turning away from your sin and accepting the shed blood of Christ that sin is removed and it's the only thing that can come between you and Christ Almighty the one thing that can come between you and Christ is sin the commander of the Lord's army replied to Joshua remove your sandals from your feet because the place where you're standing is holy. So Joshua did so. Do you see? Do you see the connection? Okay, so let's dive into a verse by verse um, commentary and dive a little deeper into what each of these verses mean and uh, how it applies to us. The mountain of the Lord. This is this is an awesome chapter and so much in this I do believe is as we go through these verses you should see and, and a red flag should be raised for you because we start to see in the last days and over and over in the book of Isaiah we will come across in that day in the last days in the last days in that day over and over and over which when the Lord led me to the book of Isaiah I couldn't help but realize 
The more I read it, the more I understood. Yes, this very likely pertained to a time 2,700 years ago. But more and more, the more I read it, the more I began to see this is applying to us today, right now, this moment, and in the days ahead. Isaiah is reaching through time 2,760 years to speak to us today. The Lord is reaching through the prophet of Isaiah to speak to us today, to this day. These words in these books apply to us in the times that we are living in, brothers and sisters. And that's that's why I wanted to do um, a verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Isaiah, because how important it is. And I want you to be able to see the importance of these words, these prophecies, and what they hold for us today. I can't wait till we get to 53, um, chapter 53, it speaks about the Lord. Um, I, I believe, if, if I'm correct on that, uh, Isaiah, 777 years before Jesus Christ fulfilled that prophecy, Isaiah gave it 777 years, 777. I think it's amazing, but that's a long ways off, so let's stick with two. Um, this is what, I'm going to read through the verses here, and then we'll go through and we'll, we'll dig deeper. Um, so I've already read the entire chapter, but let's, let's go through verse by verse here. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many people, many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his way, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations. He will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war any more. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. So just looking at that, we know this isn't any other time. This is speaking to a specific time in the last days. How do we know that? Because there has been war ever since. There has been war in the Middle East for thousands of years. It's still going on today. Have the, have the nations all come to the mountain of the Lord? No. Have the nations all taken their swords and beaten them into plowshares and, and not trained for war anymore? No. No. Has the descendants of Jacob, are they walking in the light of the Lord? No. <laughs> Absolutely not. No. Uh, the the people that call themselves Jews and who are not Jews are who run Israel today. But we always know, as the Lord has always shown us throughout the entire Bible, He has a remnant there in Israel. Um, but that's a topic for another video that I'm going to be doing very soon. Those who call themselves Jews and are not. Anyway, okay, so two, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. The nations will come to Jerusalem. In spite of Israel's condition, in Isaiah's own time, Isaiah predicts that the nations of the earth would come to the Lord's temple to learn God's instructions, his Torah for life. This mission to the nations is a recurring theme in the book. If those Gentiles would someday seek to walk in his paths, should not Israel now walk in the light of the Lord? Verses 2-4 through four, um, nearly identical to Micah 4.1, which says, But in the last days it will come about that the temple mount of the Lord will be firmly set as the leading mountain. It will be exalted above its surrounding hills, and people will stream toward it. Verse 2, Many nations will approach and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, and to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us about his ways, and we will walk according to his directions. Indeed, the law will proceed from Zion, and the message of the Lord will from Jerusalem. 
verse 3, and he will judge among many people, rebuking strong nations far away, and they will reshape their swords as plowshares, and their spears as pruning hooks. No nation will threaten another, nor will they train for war any more. See, those two, those verses sound almost identical. Scholars are divided over which is original and whether both use a common source, but whatever the intermediate source is, what Isaiah saw makes it plain that the Lord inspired Isaiah's words. Isaiah did not merely copy them from someone else. In verse 2, the last days, um, like I was saying, it may be interpreted in one of three ways. The vague, distant future, um, just like Genesis 49.1, which says, After this Jacob called his sons together and told them, Assemble yourselves around me so that I can tell you all what is going to happen to you in the last days. This Christian era, Hosea 3.5, Afterward the people of Israel will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They will come in awe to the Lord and the goodness and his goodness in the last days. You see the relation there. Acts 2.17 In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on everyone. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Acts 2.17 In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on everyone. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will even pour out my spirit on my slaves, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. I will display wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood, fire, and clouds of smoke. Do we not see that today? Do we not see that happening right now? All over the earth there is fire everywhere right now. Everywhere. Acts 2.20, the sun will become dark and the moon turn to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. 21, then whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Um, wow, that is that is speaking to us. Can you can you feel him reaching through? The only thing that that hasn't happened there is the sun becoming dark, and I think I think Isaiah thirty twenty six speaks to that, where it says the moon will be as bright as the sun, and the sun will be as hot as seven days in a row in one day. I think that's what's happening right now. Right now, that prophecy is being fulfilled. Second Peter three three. First of all, you must understand this. In the last days, mockers will come, and following their own desires will ridicule us. Verse 4, by saying, What happened to the Messiah's promise to return? Ever since our ancestors died, everything continues as it did from the beginning of creation. Verse 5, But they deliberately ignore the fact that long ago the heavens existed and the, water was, and the earth was formed by God's word out of water and with water. Verse 6, By which... The world at that time was deluged with water and destroyed. Verse 7. Now by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been reserved for fire and are being kept for the day when ungodly people will be judged and destroyed. 8. Don't forget this fact, dear friends. With the Lord, a single day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a single day. 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some people understand slowness but is being patient with you. He does not want anyone to perish, but wants everyone to repent. 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day the heavens will disappear with a, with a roaring sound. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything on it will be exposed. 11. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, think of the kind of holy and godly people you ought to be. 12. As you look forward to and hasten the coming of the day of God, when the heavens will be set ablaze and dissolve, and the elements will melt with fire. And James 5.3 Your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be used as evidence against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have stored up treasures in these last days. For look, the wages that you, that are, that you kept back from the workers you harp, who harvested your fields are shouting out against you, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of heavenly armies. Verse 5, you have lived in luxury and pleasure on earth. You have fattened yourselves for the day of slaughter.
In one sense, this prediction has been fulfilled since the coming of Christ, but there will yet be another greater fulfillment at the end of the age. Uh, see notes on Amos 2.16, which says, This is probably the earliest mention of the day of the Lord in the prophetic writings. It is a key theme in, in the book of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And the so-called so -called minor, minor prophets called only that, so because their books are just much shorter, especially Joel, Obadiah, and Zephaniah. The day can refer to a severe judgment on a nation or the people of God. While these events may very well happen in the near, very near future, the prophets also announce a final day of the Lord when all the nations of the earth will be judged. Uh, the word mountains, thought to be the homes of the gods, I call them Mount Zion, the highest of the mountains, Isaiah is saying that the nations will one day realize that Yahweh is the one true God. And I pray for that every day, brothers and sisters, as I think we all should. I pray for the lost, the lukewarm, and my future brothers and sisters in Israel. And pray and beg, plead, and pray that the Lord would restore their sight. And that they too would bow down and repent of their rejection and beg this movie. That is something we should all pray for, brothers and sisters. Every single day, we should be praying for that. Uh, verse 3. Isaiah 2 3 walk how the Bible describes our relationship with God is not a static position but a dynamic companionship that moves from its beginning to its appointed destination see Genesis 5 22 and 24 which says after he fathered Methuselah Enoch communed with God for 300 years and fathered other sons and daughters Enoch lived for a total of 365 years communing with God and then he was no more, because God had taken him. And there Enoch pops up again. Tell me, brothers and sisters, tell me there's not a reason that that's not happening. Anyway. Uh, see also 17.1 Genesis. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham, Abram and announced, I am God Almighty. Live in constant awareness that I am always with you and be blameless. And Genesis 48:15. Then Israel blessed Joseph by saying, "May the God in whose presence my ancestors Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has continued shepherding me my whole life even unto today." In Deuteronomy 28:9, the Lord will assign to you to be a holy people for Himself, just as He promised you, as long as you keep His commands and walk in His ways. And First Kings 3, six. so Solomon said, You have demonstrated abundant gracious love to your servant David, my father, as he lived in your presence truthfully, righteously, and uprightly in his heart. In addition, you have kept on showing this abundant gracious love by giving him a son to sit on his throne today. And also like the word faithful. Uh, which takes us to take a look at Psalms. Um, who shall, Psalms 15, who shall dwell on your holy hill, your holy mountain? Psalms 15, 1, Lord, who may stay in your tent, who may dwell on your holy mountain? 2, the one who lives with integrity, who does righteous deeds, and who speaks truth to himself. Verse 3, the one who does not slander with his tongue, who does no evil to his neighbor, and who does not destroy his friend's reputation. 4. The one who despises those who are utterly wicked, but who honors the one who fears the Lord, who keeps his word, even when it hurts and does not change. And verse 5. Who does not loan his money with interest, and who does not take a bribe against those who are innocent. The one who does these things will stand firm forever. Jeremiah 32:23. They came and took possession of it, but they didn't obey you or walk according to your law. So they didn't. They didn't do what you commanded them to do. So you caused all this calamity to happen to them. And it also relates to the word follow. Malachi 2:6. True teachings were in his mouth, and falsehood was not found on his lips. 
he walked with me peacefully and righteously, and he turned many from sin. John 8.12, later on Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And Romans 6, 4. Therefore, through baptism, we are buried with him into, de into his death, so that just as the Messiah was raised from the dead by the Father's glory, we too may live an entirely new life. And the word live, like Galatians 5, 16. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will never fulfill the desires of the flesh. And Colossians 1, 10. So that you might live in a manner worthy of the Lord and be fully pleasing to him as you bear fruit while doing all kinds of good things and growing in the full knowledge of God. Live a life. So we see uh, the next word we look at here is law, God's instructions. And we're looking at 2-3, just so you know. this. I know there's, there's a lot of words when we look into 2-3, the word walk, that was all all directed at that one word walk and giving you descriptions on how the Bible um, defines that word for us and, and different verses we can find that there's a whole lot of verses for walk but those are just the ones that I chose the next word is law God's instructions uh, for life not in the negative sense what God condemns us when we try to use it as a means of justification and the next word Zion, which is a reference to Jerusalem, the name expresses theological significance. It represents the people of God, whether they are in a sinful present state, rebelling against their Lord, or more frequently in their redeemed state, living in a relationship with Him. And Isaiah 2 verse 4 now pictures... Uh, two four. Let's go back. He will judge between the nations, and he will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Pictures a world in which genuine peace exists on the earth, as the Holy Spirit enables people to live out God's holy character. Some interpreters understand that the reference to be a Christ millennial age. And 2, 6 through 4, 1, 2, 6 is, You, Lord, have abandoned your people, the descendants of Jacob. They are full of superstitions from the east. They practice divination like the Philistines and embrace pagan customs. I think that's still happening today. If you look at the uh, Kabbal Kabbalist, Kabbalists, that's exactly what they're practicing today. The, Kabbalists came from the east. That's exactly what's happening in Israel today, but it was also Isaiah's time in 740 BC. Um, Israel's pride is brought low. Isaiah, unwilling to let his healer or his hearers use a prophecy of glorious future to escape from grim realities in the present, defines the present condition and the inevitable result of that condition. He shows how the people are enamored with human and earthly greatness. That's exactly what's happening today, and that's happening in our own nation. Um, armor, amored with human and earthly greatness, and how that must necessarily result in desolation and humiliation. As the textual unit progresses, there are more and more graphic illustrations of both one, self-exaltation, and two, desolation and humiliation. The people flee into the caves and the rocks. And think about that for just a minute. That's, uh, let's go here real quick. There's that verse. Verse Isaiah 2.10. Go into the rocks, hide in the ground from the fearful of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty. Where does that verse sound familiar, huh? Revelation 6.15, then the kings of the earth, the important peoples, the generals, the rich, the powerful, and all the slaves and free people concealed themselves in caves among the rocks in the mountains. They told the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of the wrath has come, and who is able to endure it? That's a direct relation to this verse here in Isaiah. Those two are exactly the same. Go into the rocks. Hide in the ground from the fearful presence of the Lord in the splendor of his majesty. 
this commentary didn't make that connection, but I did. As soon as I read that, I was like, that sounds exactly like the book of Revelation, which is why, I mean, none of these verses come out and, and say, uh, this, is to, this is to the people of Isaiah in his time, and this is to the people of the future. You have to have the Holy Spirit to discern these things. And there's, there's, little, there's little cookies all throughout the book of Isaiah that are speaking to us this day. That's, that's why the more I read this, the more I started to uh, have my eyes opened by the Holy Spirit that he was reaching through and pointing these things out to me and, and illuminating them to me. He was speaking to us through these words. Anyway, sorry, I get I, I get so excited. He also goes on, more youths are to replace the falsely uh, falsely revered leaders who have ruined God's vineyard. Finally, Isaiah compares Jerusalem to a haughty, exquisitely dressed woman who is stripped and brought down into the dust. Verses uh, 6 through 22, the Lord alone will be exalted. The people are full of things this world calls great. That's exactly what, what is happening today, is it not? The world is full of things that the people call great. Look at all our technology, our cell phones. This world holds our cell phones as, as they revere them above the Bible, above everything. That's the first thing people look at in the morning. What is it? The cell phone. What's the last thing they look at before they go to sleep? Their cell phone. It's, it's, it's what they look at 20 thousand times a day their cell phone it's they hold the things of this world up and call them great that's exactly what's happening in this day and as a result they will be brought low all the lofty things of creation will be brought low and the people who trusted in them making idols of them will flee to the caverns and the rocks just like it says there in verse 20 21 uh, verses 2-6 the descendants of Jacob are full of pagan superstitions, magical customs that seem to make the powers of creation subject to human manipulation. 2.7. The land is full of wealthy and military armaments. 2.7 was their land is full of silver and gold. There is no end to their treasures. 2.8. Idols. Their land is full of idols and they bow down to the work of their hands to what their fingers have made. Human hands made these gods in human form, the ultimate exaltation of humanity. Verses 9 through 11, all human attempts to exalt themselves are doomed to failure because everything in creation is subordinate to God, the only one who is exalted, Christ Jesus. He alone is self-existent and the only one who can say, I am. When humans try to make themselves ultimate in the universe, they render themselves meaningless in his eyes. Verses 12 through 17, God will humble every great thing on the earth in which humans tend to, tend to glorify, whether natural or man-made. Verse 17, almost identical to verse 11, which is... The arrogance of man will be brought low, and human pride will be humbled. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Verses 18 through 22. And the idols will be totally, totally disappear. People will flee to the caves and the rocks, and to the holes in the ground, from the fearful presence of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he rises to shake the earth. It's just like Revelation. Just That's why I made that comparison when I read those says it twice in chapter 2. It talks about the people fleeing to the caves and, and, and in the rocks, hiding themselves from the fearful presence of the Lord. Go back and look at Revelation, and let me read it again, 6, 15 through 17. The, then the kings of the earth, the important people, the generals, the rich, the powerful, and all the slaves and free people concealed themselves in the caves and among the rocks and the mountains. They told the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to endure it? Tell me those two weren't related. 
verses 18 through 22. The idolatry which humans attempt to make themselves equal to God can only humiliate them. In the day of judgment it will utterly fail them, and they will throw away all their idols, their human-made attempts to manipulate the, manipulate the universe, ha, huh. as they try to hide from God's all-seeing eyes. Verses, verse 20, moles and bats. In that day the people will throw away to the moles, in that day, okay, so they're talking about the idols, in that day the people will throw away to the moles and bats their idols of silver and gold, which they made to worship. They were considered unclean. The people will consider their supposedly holy idols made of precious metals, both worthless and unclean. Verse 22, a powerful concluding statement. Humans are utterly dependent creatures who are only one breath away from death. Why put any trust in them? And verse 22 was stop trusting in mere humans who have but a breath in their nostrils. Why hold them in esteem? Well, I hope that gave you a better understanding. Uh, first, verse by verse, look at chapter two, and we'll keep doing this. It's, this is very exciting, and I love teaching this like this. And the Lord has really, has really opened my eyes to this, and I hope I've opened your eyes to this too, and help giving you a better understanding here of chapter two. We'll keep doing this through the entire book of Isaiah. Um, God bless you and be with you, and I love each and every one of you. Peace and grace.